Welcome to Philosophy 15. I'm Robert Talese. I'm Scott Aiken. Uh, these are 15-minute conversations unscripted between two philosophers about whatever's on our mind, actually. Uh, and today, uh, Scott has been thinking very hard for a very long time about what in epistemology is called the problem of the criterion. The problem of the criterion. So, the problem of the criterion can be stated roughly as follows. How do we sort true propositions or true impressions from false impressions without already presuming that we've done that? Um, so, one answer to the, the question, how can we sort them, is that we've got a criterion. We've got, they, they pass a sniff test or they, they look right to us. Um, and then the thought is, okay, well, whatever that property is of the, those impressions or those propositions or so on, there's a property that tells us that, the, that that's a truth indica indicating property. Um, how, well, how do we know that that's a pr truth indi indicating property? And the thought is, well, that we know that there are truths that that property indicates. But we would have then, as a consequence, had to have already had the truths in hand in order to tell that that was a truth indicating property. So we've got, how do I sort truths from falses? I've got a good criterion. How do you know it's a good criterion? Because it sorts truths from falses, right? And so we're kind of caught on what Sextus Empiricus and the ancients called the dialelos, the wheel, uh, that you're kind of caught in this little circle, a little loop of questions. And maybe one way to even kind of, an kind of put it is to kind of make it analogous to a number of these sort of chicken and egg kinds of problems. It looks like you need one to have the other and you need the other to have the one. Um, there's a kind of a puzzle of what's sometimes called epistemic priority. I need to have the truths to know that I've got a good criterion. I've got to ha have a good criterion to know that these are truths. So that's the problem of the criterion in a nutshell. It's pretty easy. It's again one of these sort of nice philosophical problems that's kind of easy to kind of get, get, get your head around. Uh, but the easiness to get your head around of the problem it, uh, belies the difficulty of solving the problem. Understanding it is one challenge, fixing it is another one. And, uh, and so the problem of the criterion has been one of these long-standing problems in epistemology um, that make it very difficult to, to, to be able to explain what knowledge is. So one, one thought is that, well, that it works with any kind of concept, right? One thought would just be like, well, it looks like that's with truth, but it works with knowledge. Maybe it even works with other kinds of concepts. I mean, it's maybe one way to even think of how um, the paradox of analysis works, which is, uh, I've got a definition of justice, for example. I've got instances of justice, but how do I know that these instances are good? Well, because I've got a good concept. Well, how do you know a good concept? Because it sorts the right instances. So uh, the problem with the criterion is a sort of an initial instance of a number of, 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 of sort of many central puzzles as to how to figure out what many of our sort of central and fecund kinds of um, concepts are, really important concepts. And it looks like it's one that sort of, once you see the structure of the problem, it looks like it kind of bleeds out onto a lot of other things. So it's not just an epistemology problem. It's not just a sort of a problem that's sort of relegated to the old skeptical challenges. It's one that sort of is at the kind of the heart of the enterprise of philosophy, at least by my estimate. Uh, epistemological problems are kind of problems that are part of our, met uh, our philosophical methods, parts of how we think that we know or that we are at the very least in a good position to be able to state our philosophical positions. Right, but it is, um, it does enter the um, vernacular of philosophy as a skeptical challenge in epistemology. Is it, it is primarily a skeptical trope, and most of the ways that folks respond to it is that there's a kind of, you might call it mitigating or hum humilify, humiliifying, humilifying, Right. Humbling. Humbling. There we Thank you. <laughs> Humbling uh, uh, kind of consequence uh, that's supposed to be on the other side of it, that it looks like the that you you dial down the confidence that you've got in your answers uh, in light of the, how you've how you've answered that question. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it, once you've kind of got that puzzle the way that the problem, the criterion works in mind, or the and then it's sort of various cousins um, in philosophical method with the paradox of analysis. Um, there's a kind of a nice way of then being able to see how certain kinds of philosophical methods work, right? Uh, so empiricism, for example, is a sort of a nice, um, a really great observation by Roderick Chisholm that ch empiricism is a kind of answer to the problem of the criterion that you just say, look, we're going to start with a criterion sensation, 
sensation is going to be a source of truth. Sensation is going to be a source of things that you're that you that you start with, and that then you run everything in terms of I've got a criterion. Everything that is I'm, that's going to be acceptable has to live up to this criterion. There are other philosophical methods that start with the other ones. Like there's just going to be a set of truths or a set of things that are a set of instances, and all we've got are instances, and we build our we build our concepts out of these sort of higgledy-piggledy instances. So common sense theories of knowledge, common sense theories of any of these sorts of cases. Nominalisms, for example, all start as effectively particular particularist uh, features of the world. It's like, look, we've just got, what are these things got in common? The fact that they've got a name. <laughs> uh, so you just start out with instances. Um, and notice, by the way, how nominalism not only starts out with instances, but then in some ways uh, is a way of even asking whether or not we even get things wrong, right? I mean, the, the crucial thing with the problem of the criterion is that we get things wrong, right? It's possible that we can have a false impression or a false naming. Right. Um, one thing about certain kinds of strategies is to just say, there's no such thing as a false naming, right? right, right, right. The, the things are what we call them, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's one kind of strategy with the problem of the criterion is to just deny one of the background assumptions, which is, no, sometimes, you know, there are no, uh, definitions are up to us. And so whenever we say something is, you know, whenever we say th something is justice and we agree about that, then that's it, right? And then we're not, we're not wrong about that. So the, the sorting, the sorting is something that we do. Right. Does the problem of the criterion, though, differ um, in its implications or what makes it problematic? Um, uh, does it does it differ depending on uh, what the criterion that is problematic is a criterion of? Mm -hmm. So I can see that mm -hmm. it's a skeptical challenge when you're looking for a criterion of justified belief, true belief, truth, you know, entitlement, whatever epistemic concept. I can see how you get a skeptical uh, result in those cases. Um, but I'm just wondering if in these other kinds of non-epistemic, uh, non-epistemology, let's say, yeah, cases, yeah. if the problem of what we're calling these sort of other faces of the problem of the criterion aren't, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't amount to sort of a skeptical challenge, right? They okay. don't, right, so, um, uh, one might, um, uh, so, in moral and political philosophy, just imagine somebody uh, endorsing a kind of um, reflective equilibrium sort of style. Like, Great. You yeah. know, okay, so, all right, we've got certain kinds of cases of real injustice. If you don't think that, you know, slavery, torture, yeah. go down the list of all of the, right. uh, the easy cases. If you don't think these are obvious and easy cases of injustice, there's a whole other discussion that has to be had. Um, that's not maybe not even a moral discussion. That's a, you know, maybe we need to. You're not one of us. Yeah, yeah. You're right. not speaking our language. Yeah, 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 it could be all kinds of things. Yeah, sure. That that you know, I could just tell you what these words mean, or uh, or what torture is, and if you don't see it, you don't see it. Then we have to have a different kind of conversation. Um, so somebody could say, well, you know, so we've got these obvious cases that. Um, the acceptance of which, as obvious, is your sort of entry pass into the moral discussion in the first place. So if you're part of the moral discussion, we've got these cases, then, like, well, how do we know that those are hard cases? Well, we need the theory to answer the question of how we know. Yeah. Uh, we don't need the theory to know, though. We need the theory right. to know, to tell to us, explain, how, to explain. Make it explicit, yeah, 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 yeah. To make it explicit. Yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering if, so there's there's a version of what looks like the problem of the criterion there, yeah. which is, um, okay, you've got the obvious cases, you've got a theoretical apparatus now that helps you identify those obvious cases as obvious cases of justice or injustice, and... Um, with that theoretical apparatus, you're then able to go and identify other things like, you know, taxation as unjust or, you right. know, now we get wage the labor cases. as unjust. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. now you can then go and learn new things about right. what's just and unjust with the apparatus. Um, I just went, so it, it does have a chicken egg sort of bootstrappy feel right. to it, reflective equilibrium does. But I'm just wondering, it doesn't look like you've got the same skeptical upshot right. if... Um, the criterion that is referenced in the name, 
problem of the criterion is in itself a core epistemic concept. Yeah, and this is and one of the nice things about um, reflective equilibrium kind of just challenges or strategies with the problem of the criterion is that they do a good job of explaining and sort of keeping track of why these concepts are normative. Right. right. Um, because if someone said something like, well, look, I just don't see instances of slavery as unjust, right? You're like, now it looks like we've just sort of emptied the concept of whatever normative concept. Or like, like, it looks like the whole reason why we cared about that was to be able to handle the easy cases and then be able to, right? And if you're, if you're going to deny the easy cases, then we're, then we're kind of off the map as to the normativity of the concept, right? right. And so the really nice thing about, about these reflective equilibrium strategies is that they're supposed to sort of, you take a bunch of easy cases and say like, look, you know, if I can, if we can trace out how this how a theory how your theory makes it so that you can't handle easy cases or maybe even deny them uh, that looks like it's a reductio of your of your view so there's a kind of a baseline and the nice thing again about the about these strategies is that they help capture the normativity of the concept um, is it but but now the question here is but is that a skeptic is that an anti-skeptical strategy or is it like a mitigated skeptical strategy and one answer is well one answer could be well look do you do we have something, if, if we had somebody who said, I don't see torture as unjust, or I don't see slavery as unjust, right? right. And th that is within our conceptual frame. Like, we've, we've, we've seen, like, whenever Aristotle gives the apology for slavery, it's not we're like, he's just talking nonsense, I just don't understand what he's saying. Uh, we're, presumably, we would have to be able to say things back to him. It's just that it looks like we've moved to a place where these are easy cases, uh, and that's a kind of an intellectual achievement on our on our part. I mean, at the very least, we like to pat ourselves on the back right, for it, is thinking right. of such. Um, but presumably, in those cases, we still have arguments, right? It's just that we just we don't have we don't just keep going, right? So whenever John Rawls says like if if nothing's wrong, if slavery's not wrong, nothing's wrong, or something along those lines, we're like, well, that's that's kind of where we're at, right? That's the kind of the political, not metaphysical sort of strategy. But it looks to me that like if, we, if it's going to have the real anti-skeptical answer, then we can't just be like stomp on our feet whenever Aristotle says, um, gives us the defense of slavery, um, that we just say, no, it's just, no, it's just wrong. We don't have anything to say back to him. Huh. Um. So it's a kind of a, mo like, is it anti-skepticism or is it like a kind of a modest, a kind of a modest, like, well, you know, I don't have anything to say to that. Like, you're just not one of us. I mean, what's what? Like, what exactly is the force of it, right? I mean, there's the hey, you're not just you're just not one of us isn't doing justifying work. That's just like hey, that's just how we talk over here, right? Um, and so the, the you, you, we, we hanker for something more than that sort of wordy response. That yeah, right. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, you're not yeah. talking. You know, yeah. you're not you're not from around here, yeah. are you? <laughs> um, but what? Yeah, what is the upshot? I mean. So, you know, there is, I think, unavoidably, in the kind of case that you're asking, yeah. some um, philosophical maneuver that's required that looks like it's therapy, right? Now, whether that's, right. now, whether you can take that first, you dip your toe into that pool and then pull it back out and say it's not all philosophy it's not, that's there. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And it's like and it's maybe even the sort of contextual point where it's like look, we're not we're talking about this puzzle case over here. Do we have to talk about like whether or not slavery it's like we're talking about whether or not, you know, certain kind of taxation is 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 unjust. Right. Do we have to talk about slavery too? Right, right. Right. So there might be a kind of a pragmatic element to that right. where it's like calm down over there philo like philosophy 101 boy or something yeah, yeah, like that's that, right? right? Um, and maybe there's a um, that all reflective equilibrium strategies actually rest on um, the presumption, uh, the practical presumption, that um, uh, there is maybe for wordy style reasons, maybe for mm -hmm. other kinds of uh, uh, maybe it's to be explained in other kinds of ways. There will be among anybody who sees the question you know, what's justice or what's truth or anybody who can formulate these problems of the criterion, right? Yeah. Um, there will be, as a necessary precondition for even formulating the problem, some 
common ground of what uh, are sometimes called insufficiently theorized agreements. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And that's the basis from which the argument can begin. And that's kind of how, isn't that like kind of one of these background requirements for philosophy that like we seem to need to share enough of a culture for us to be able to recognize each other's arguments? Stop. <laughs> how do you stop? <laughs> how do you stop this crazy thing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is Philosophy 15, folks. I'll figure out how to turn the alarm clock off uh, in a second. Uh, we'll see you next time.